Sergio, speak. Sergio, Sergio, yes, Sergio, Sergio, Sergio. Okay, so we know we're getting sound out. Sergio. Sergio. Speak into the mic. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Checking, checking, one, two. Is that good? Convocation, come on in and take a seat. We'll get started. Thank you for coming on this important day of remembrance on 9 11. Uh, before we get started, though, with our program, just a quick reminder. Are enrolled in the class or forgotten to go on Canvas and fill out your little response card after each week. So, if you have missed a week filling out your response card on Canvas, you have until midnight tonight to get caught up, okay? After that, they will be due every Thursday at midnight, okay? That's the way that, uh, it's one of the ways that you get credit for this class, if you remember it's past fail. So make sure that you go on there and you fill out the card so that we know that you were here. Um, and just a reminder, you need to attend at least 12 of the 14 presentations and the first week, which was orientation, doesn't count as one of the 14. So if you have any questions, you can come up and see me afterwards, or Ashley, way in the back, Ashley, wave. Okay, all right, great. 
Thanks. And don't forget tonight after class, it only takes a few minutes to log on to Canvas and fill that thing out before midnight. You're, you'll be good. All right. Um, one other announcement. If you are interested in being on the convocation committee, we are having our first meeting tonight at 5 o'clock in the humanities room in that little lounge area in between the two faculty offices, halls. So come and join us and we'll be assigning people to help out with advertising and help when we have uh, guest speakers and guest presenters helping to host them as well. Okay, we are going to begin today's program with the musical selection by Sheila Banter and Jake Osler from the Commercial Music Ensemble. Sheila will be singing I'm Proud to be an American, followed by uh, a presentation on Remembering 9-11 by three of our own Snow, Co Snow College professors, Dr. David Allred, who's the Depar Department Chair of English, Renee Fox, who's Associate Professor of Geology, and Dr. Larry Smith, who is Professor of Physics and Mathematics. And we will turn the time now over to Sheila. If tomorrow all the things were gold, I'd worked for all my life. And I had to start again with just my family by my side. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take the Appreciate that musical number. Uh, my name is David Allred, and with Larry Smith and Renee Fox, uh, we're happy to be here today to make this presentation. We wanted to begin by showing you a quick clip, a video clip, be three and a half minutes from the Today Show, 
13 years ago this morning. I don't think we could feel shock waves, but we, we sort of felt like we did. And we were in a position where we could see um, the Trade Center almost immediately between the other buildings. Uh, and an enormous fireball that must have been 300 feet across was visible immediately. Um, a secondary explosion, I think, and then plumes of smoke. There must, be, there must have been a three-block cloud of, of white smoke. Now, from where I was on the street a moment ago, you can, in fact, see smoke leaving the building on three sides. It seems to be coming out on at least four or five floors. Um, the air is filled with hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper that are just sort of floating like confetti. Um, the area is swarmed with emergency vehicles, and sirens. Have you Obviously, seen, we're very sensitive to this kind of thing in this neighborhood. Elliot, have you, of course, because of the incident that occurred in the early 1990s, have you seen any any evidence, Elliot, of, of people being taken out of the building? Uh, you say that emergency vehicles are there, understandably so, but of course the major concern is human oh loss. I mean, do you know if there were many people in the building? Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yes. can see it on the shot. Oh my Something God. Something else has you just been that. You know what? We just saw a plane circling the building. We just saw a plane circling the building a second ago on the shot right before I that. I think there may have been another impact. Can you tell? I just heard another very loud bang and a very large plane that might have been a DC-9 or a 747 just flew past my window and I think it may have hit the train center again. To be, to be honest, Elliot, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get the impression that it was that big a plane. It looked I, big from here. I did see a plane go by a second ago, though, and it, it, it has now impacted the building. I'm yeah. trying to see if it's the different tower. Yeah. I think it may have been. I think the first one was World Trade Center 1, and it looks, from what I'm seeing on the television, like it may have been We're the second see, building. This is a piece of tape, and we may actually see another plane enter the picture here in a second. I wonder if there are air traffic. Let's go back to Jennifer Oberstein, who was talking to a second ago. Jennifer, did you see this happen? Hello? Did Jennifer? you just see this happen, Jennifer? Matt, I've, I've, I've never seen any, it looks like a movie. I saw a robber's plane, like a jet, go immediately heading directly into the World Trade Center. It, it just flew into it, into the, into the other tower coming from south to north. I watched the plane fly into the World Trade Center. It was a jet. It was a very large plane. It was going fast. It went past the rich cotton of Thomas being built in Battery Park. It went through right past it, almost hit it, and then went in. This is so shocking, of course, to everybody watching. I, I've never seen anything like it. It literally flew itself into World Trade Center. Obviously, now we, we move from what, what appears to have. There it is right there. Again, I'm looking from south to north. That, and it went into the, the one on the right. That appeared to be at least a 727. We saw it a second ago. Here, here comes the videotape that we, we just showed you. You will see what appears to be a large plane. It could be a 727 right there, maybe even bigger, flying right into the side of the World Trade Center. It was at least a 727. I, it was a jet. I couldn't believe my eyes watching it right above me. And, and now you, you have to move from talk about a possible accident to talk about something deliberate that has happened here. We're going to immediately check with air traffic control in the area to find out if they had contact with either of these planes before the act. This is shocking video to watch. And some of us in this audience can remember that morning watching this live. And some, I know some of the audience were too young to remember this. Uh, the freshman this year, I, I think we're four or five years old on September 11th. Um, What strikes me about that video, though, is the, the efforts to make sense of what was going on that morning. You hear, you hear them talking about problems with their tra traffic control, about a possible accident, uh, not, really, not knowing the size of the plane. And the, the shock of that moment is, is really powerful for us to, to watch. I think, though, that we're still trying to make sense of the event 13 years later. Uh, and toward that end, three years ago, there was a team of faculty 
here on campus that designed a course had the recommendation of a, one of the college vice presidents that we would teach a class on 9-11 for the 10-year anniversary of the tragedy. And the goal of the, con or the class was to bring together academics from a wide range of disciplines and to see what, how their fields, how their types of study could shed light on what happened on 9-11, about why it happened, about why it was significant. And so I, I taught part of that class and my focus was on the literature of 9-11. We focused on literary arts, what they, the drama and the literature and the poetry they wrote about the event. Um, and then Larry presented on the physics of 9-11 of and Renee talked about geology in 9-11. And we have four presenters who were part of that class that I wanted to quickly let you know who they were too. We had Todd Lawrence come and he, he did a Skype, taught by Skype one day. He's been at the University of St. Thomas in uh, Minnesota and has done a lot of research about the shrines in Pennsylvania that occurred at, at the site of where one of the planes went down. Uh, Greg Wright from the English department talked about the ethics of torture. Kent Dean talked about cinematic representations of 9-11. And Doug Dyering from Bismuth talked about the stock market and the impact of 9-11 on our economy. Nick Morrison talked about the idea of fear and also about how we remember traumatic events. And Mike Brinchley talked about madrasas and fundamentalism in the Middle East. And all these perspectives brought together a really rich body of work for us to consider. And the students really enjoyed the class and we enjoyed being part of it. And I think it highlighted one thing that's really important for us at the snow and why we teach general education classes. Because there were all these different perspectives and I'm not a physicist or a sociologist, so I learned a lot from what they were saying. Um, but I've come to this conclusion that the, cl the class helped me realize that I really think that every discipline has an something to offer. They ask a question about reality in a certain way, and knowing what those questions are can be really valuable to us in our education. So I'm gonna make the assertion here today that sometimes it's as important to have powerful questions to ask as it is to have the right answers. And I'm going to turn the time over now to Larry Smith and, we'll, and then Renee Fox will speak and then I'll basically begin. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to commemorate this event. It was a traumatic event as uh, Professor Marston mentioned when we uh, try to, uh, uh, when we recall those events, they're very strong in our memories for those of us that were old enough to remember this. And I remember seeing those images that we just watched on the television clip. Uh, as I was getting ready to come to work and teach class, and I came to, it happened to be the honors physics class that morning, and we weren't quite sure what to do. Should we even be in class for something that uh, was as dramatic and traumatic as this was? And we decided uh, that while it certainly affected us deeply, that the best thing that we could do at that time was to continue our, our education and continue to have class, so we did. But, uh, so, I was uh, invited to be a guest lecturer in this 9-11 class that was held three years ago as part of the 10-year commemoration of this event. And uh, the topic of the discussion is uh, how physicists view things and how they create knowledge, how scientists in general and physicists in particular might analyze something like this event and try to figure out what we can learn, how it happened, and, and maybe some reasons about why it happened. And so, as uh, physicists are wont to do, we like to emphasize the laws of nature that we have found through centuries of observation and experimentation. And uh, a couple of these, I've got a couple of slides here of some of the laws of nature that you probably have become acquainted with in your high school physics class, or maybe you've had a physics class here at Snow College, and learned about some of these uh, particular laws of nature. For example, clear back in the early 1600s, Galileo taught us the law of falling bodies, which says that uh, if there is no air resistance, then all objects fall with the same acceleration. That means if you drop them from the same height at the same time, and if you can ignore air resistance, then they would hit the ground at the same time, regardless of their size or their mass or any other features of them. They would all fall together and hit the ground at the same time. Now, it is important that we say that air resistance must be negligible because if there is air resistance, then that statement isn't true. It is, you know, if you had two balls that look about the same, one of them's actually heavier than the other, and you do have air resistance, then the heavy one will hit the ground first. But it's interesting to analyze the, uh, the disaster of 9-11 in terms of this law 
as those buildings fell down? And uh, did they fall as if there was air resistance or as if they were in free fall? And we have a little equation here at the bottom about how long it would take something to fall from a certain distance and reach the ground if, it, if it's not encountering air resistance. Here's some other um, laws of nature that we would put to play in an analysis of this. So there's, obviously this was in a time when there were uh, video recorders, you saw that on the television, the news uh, people were there, the journalists were there, we have lots of video recordings of this, and we can now go back frame by frame and analyze those uh, videos and see if they uh, tell us anything through application of these laws of physics. Again, you probably are acquainted with these from some class in the, in the past. Newton's laws of motion talk about the law of inertia, you, you remember this as an object in motion tends to stay in the same straight line motion unless it is acted upon by an external force. And the second uh, law of Newton, I like to tell my students it's the most important equation in the universe, that says that it, it will change its motion if it is uh, acted on by an external force. That F stands for the force, the M stands for the mass of the object, and the A talks about its change in velocity or its acceleration. And you've also heard the third law, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So physicists would apply these three laws of Newton to the building collapses. We're also familiar with Newton's law of gravitation. It may not be super important in this particular context, but it does. it is what keeps us glued to the earth, so we like that one too. Also, principles of momentum and energy, those are terms that you use almost every day in various contexts. We have specific definitions for them in physics. We like to make sure that we're communicating clearly so we have very specific and including mathematical definitions for what momentum is and what energy is. And we have a, an idea that those two quantities, momentum and energy, are conserved. Now, that doesn't mean we just save them up, like it might mean to conserve uh, water or something like that. In physics content context, Conservation means that it's the same before and after an event. So if there's a collision or a collapse or something, we'd be able to uh, analyze this by saying, what's the momentum beforehand? What's the momentum afterwards? And same with the energy, and maybe we could come to some conclusions about actually what happened even if we weren't there. A little side note quickly, uh, when I was in graduate school, my professor, my major professor, moonlighted as an expert witness for the courts. And I remember on occasion, he'd haul into the lab where I worked, uh, the hood of a car with dents in it. And he'd say, we've we got to analyze this, guys. We've got to figure out what causes dent, how fast the thing was going that made the dent, and what direction it was coming from. And so we would apply these laws of conservation and momentum <coughs> and energy so that he could go back to court with his car hood and say, well, so-and-so was at fault, and they should get the ticket, or they should be liable for the damages. Even though my professor wasn't there and, and my fellow graduate students and I weren't there, we could do some analysis after the fact based on these laws of physics and come to some conclusions. And that's one of the things that uh, scientists, expert witnesses do. Well, uh, another thing that you certainly have heard about uh, in your long career of, as a student is the scientific method. Sometimes there's a poster on your uh, junior high or middle school classroom wall has the seven steps of the scientific method. Uh, I'm not a real big fan of that poster because it implies that uh, it's a very linear process, almost like you're checking off boxes. Okay, now I've collected some data, now I've made a hypothesis, almost like you had to do in your uh, science fair entry where they make you go through those check boxes. And working scientists don't do the checkbox method. They do all those things, it's part of the scientific approach scientific attitude, but they kind of do them all at once, and it's not such a linear, rigid process. S but it is important, okay, so kind of throw out the seven-step poster, but do remember that that is kind of how scientists think. We make observations, we do make measurements, we try to find out, uh, you know, exact numbers about things. We perform experiments, we design experiments to tease out the, uh, the data that Mother Nature might have to tell us. We create mathematical models, and including sometimes we program those into a computer and let the computer crunch on things and tell us things that might be happening as well using those equations. And then we come up with theories, which are not wild guesses. In science, a theory is a very well-established uh, 
body of work with a whole bunch of evidence supporting it. So this is kind of the attitude and approach physicists have to things. And so when we come to uh, the 9-11 event, looking at the World Trade Center towers here, these are a, a collage of pictures before the event. And then the next slide is a picture of, of some of them that happened after the uh, event. You can see as they're going on right now. I want to call particular attention to the picture in the lower right hand corner. There's another building that was just across the street, a few hundred yards away, and it was also part of the World Trade Center, but it was Building 7, World Trade Center 7, and uh, not very many people remember this because we usually just see the Twin Towers. But uh, I'm going to show you just a short video about that building collapsing, which I hope I am. Check the floor. later, same day, but hours after the other buildings were hit and fell. And there's a collage of videos there that uh, we're not going to see, but um, uh, of different views of it falling. And it's kind of a surprise because no planes hit it. And how long did it take? This is a 47-story building, so it's not nearly as tall as the... Uh, uh, we're not even going to get PowerPoint to work either. Um, so it's not nearly as tall as the Twin Towers, but it came down amazingly fast in an amazingly straight line and collapsed right onto its own footprint and uh, didn't really spread out a lot. There was a cloud of dust that came out, which Renee's going to tell us about in a minute. But the building itself just went straight down, and when you analyze the video frames, it actually looks like it went down faster than we would have expected. That is to say that if one floor fell and hit the next floor, and then it, it would kind of slow it down, the next floor would slow it down, and then those would hit the next floor down, it would kind of offer some resistance and slow it down, and so on, kind of the pancake idea, it should take quite a long time. You compute that, it should take about 10 seconds for the building to fall straight down like that. And if you analyze the video frame by frame, it only takes 6.6 .6 seconds, or yeah, 6.6 .6 seconds to fall down, which is way faster than it should have. And so if you just dropped an object with no air resistance, so suck out all the air, but dropped an object from 47 stories high and time how long it takes to hit the ground, it should only take six seconds. So this building fell almost at the speed of an object in free fall or with no air resistance at all. Um, So, what conclusions can we come, come to? Um, I'm looking at my next slide here, and I hope you can get your slides, Renee. Well, yeah, we might want to do that. Can we restart? Why don't you restart it, and I'll finish up here. So, uh, for, this for my participation in this multidisciplinary class that we had on 9-11, I actually invited another physicist who is very well known in this area to come talk to the students. And he has done all these analyses. And uh, he actually came to the conclusion that especially World Trade Center 7 fell at a much faster rate than it should have. And so you start to wonder what conclusions can you come to from a physics analysis. And some of those conclusions are not very comfortable. Um, and that leads us back to Professor Allred's uh, comment that sometimes the questions are maybe more important than the answers. But um, this particular professor comes to a very unpopular conclusion that says it wasn't the airplanes that made those buildings fall, especially this World Trade Center 7, because it didn't even get hit by a building. And so he believes that there were planted explosives in the building beforehand that were then purposefully triggered to bring down those buildings. That is not uh, a consensus opinion, but it is an opinion that you ought to be exposed to because uh, those questions are important for us to um, analyze. I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be part of the honors program and part of that interdisciplinary class. We examine various important <coughs> questions from uh, different uh, perspectives. 
and it's an exciting way to approach education, and I hope you would consider that in the future. I'm going to turn the time over to Renee now, and we're going to have the computer back up shortly. You have to invite the geologist that um, we are a very visual science geologist, so it's going to be hard for me to do this without the slides, but let me see if I can talk to you while we're waiting for them. You know, when David proposed this class um, and asked for participation in what we had to contribute, I think it, it was really difficult for me as a geologist to have, to have an idea. I mean, I, I can usually say, oh yeah, we could do this, or we could do this, or we could do this. And this was a really hard topic for me. And I think the biggest reason for me personally was that this is such an emotional thing and, and such a, a, a tragedy in terms of what happened. And to approach that from geology, there you just sort of have to put your emotions aside and do science and you just, I think, don't feel like you're honoring the event like you should. Um, but geologists did have something to contribute. So let me see if I can find what that was. I'll keep talking. So, one of the things that geologists do, we're a very diverse group, but one of the things that we do um, today is a lot of, one, remote sensing. So, geologists can look at the Earth and even places like Mars and make analyses about what we're seeing, even though we're not at the surface. And another thing that geologists will tend to contribute is our ability to understand what things are made of. So immediately after, about a week after 9-11, um, the U.S. Geological Survey asked NASA, it must have been... Why do you think that, that, that part of the component of news coverage around the country every year is the excitement and the fun that people get watching an old building being demolished and they're wired very carefully for days and it's a very careful operation in order to make sure that a building can... All right, one sec. I think we have a slide. So the U.S. Geological Survey um, asked the asked NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab for um, one of their instruments that they put on a plane, and they did a study um, using an instrument that they call. They did a study with an instrument that they call a virus. Um, and a virus stands for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer. So basically they have this, this, this instrument up in a plane, and the plane um, used different wavelengths of light, and what will happen is as that light hits different things, they're able to image what they're seeing. What the USGS was interested in mainly was the dust. So this was the biggest issue for us. Um, I don't know if any of you can imagine why we would be, why we would care about the dust. It's just slow. So this is a virus, um, just kind of an image of what they do, and this is an image of, I think it's going to be okay. This is an image of just showing you, um, we're scientists so we have to show graphs, right? So you can see these are the different wavelengths that those different materials will give off. So the cool thing is that we can just look at it from the air and, and find some things out. So what did a virus do? Well, the first thing it did immediately, you can see the, the picture on the left is um, September 16th, so that was five days later, and then September 23rd. And it was able to image the hot spots and those red areas that you see on the screen were actually over 800 degrees Celsius, so that's eight times the boiling point of water. They were able to help um, firefighters to pinpoint where they should um, work. Um, this shows an image of where the dust is and also what the dust is composed of. 
And a lot of people were breathing this dust in, and one of the worries was, you know, what, what are we taking in? And so this is a virus, again, saying, well, the dust is composed of, I think you can see right here, gypsum board. So you can imagine there would have been a lot of wall board that was pulverized by that. Um, this is another image that shows the spatial distribution of the dust. So where did it go? Um, what people were affected by the dust? Um, the next image actually, again from a virus, is showing us what the composition was. And these are different CH, uh, organic molecules, carbon hydrogen molecules. Um, and I mentioned to Larry earlier, I said, you know, this, this conspiracy hypothesis, you can't call it a theory, the conspiracy hypothesis would have to be supported by some chemistry. So this is a neat thing where we can see that we would, the geologists would say, hey, well, if there were explosives, we should see a signature of that. So that's kind of a cool thing that could add to that question. And just one more from a virus. This is showing us one of the big things we were interested in is there is asbestos in the building. We know that asbestos in certain forms can be cancer causing. And so they could actually look at the dust with a virus and estimate the different types of asbestos. And you can't see this much, but there's some little red dots here, kind of, and here, you can see one over here. And that's the type of asbestos that when you breathe it in, causes um, a higher preponderance of lung cancer. So that was from the air, and then the US Geological Survey actually got permission to go in and collect dust samples, and you can see the locations of the dust samples. So this is a map of the southern part of the island. And um, so there, you can see they collected them from both indoors. Um, people had their windows open, remember September, so a lot of you would have your windows open now. This is just a picture of the dust. So then we took it back to the lab, I shouldn't say we, they, took it back to the lab and they analyzed it using all sorts of really neat equipment, X-ray diffractometry, and they actually did a spectral analysis again in the lab because as scientists, we're never gonna trust that plane flying over. We wanna see, we wanna double check that, so we looked at the dust with the same instruments in the lab to see if the signals matched what we were getting from the air. We use cool microscopes called scanning electron microscopes and they allow us to see a lot about samples that we couldn't see. We did chemical analyses, they did chemical analyses, they also did what they call leachate analyses where they dissolve them in water. Um, this was just a statement from the USGS. So the objective of that was to check a virus but it was also um, to see if that could um, or if we could figure out some more about the dust. Let's skip over these um, more cool. Like, this is what you see from an x-ray diffractometer. The cool thing about x-ray diffractometers is every single mineral can be identified by where these little blips are. So you can see over here it's saying, oh, well, we have calcite in the dust and quartz in the dust and gypsum and, and these different minerals. Um, and we can check then to see that those are going along with the spectroscope. These are some images from a scanning electron microscope. And using the scanning electron microscope, we identified a type of asbestos called chrysotile, and that's the type that when it gets in your lungs can cause cancer. This is from another dust sample, and these are fibers of gypsum, which would have come from the wall board. And then they then mapped that out, so you can see, again, the, the, one of the big concerns, not the only concern in the dust, but one of the big concerns was how much asbestos is in it, and where is it located? So they then put a map together, because that's the other thing that geologists love to do. And they show the amount of, of um, crystal asbestos in the dust. Um, they chemically analyze the dust. And you can see this is um, not minerals, but elements. And you can see um, that there's some elements here that you might pick up. And there's, it tells you this down here. It says that there's things that we call heavy metals, and those are also of concern. Those are things that we don't want to ingest in our bodies in certain amounts. So they wanted to get a handle on how much of that was there. Um, and you can see that it, the, the bottom statement right here, and I can't see it on my screen, so I'm gonna turn and read here. The mean concentrations of some heavy metals in the dust samples, such as molybdenum, zinc, copper, lead, chromium, manganese, and so on, are relatively high compared to their mean concentrations in natural soil. So we already know how much is like on the average, and we're saying this is higher than the average, so this could be a problem. And they map those out in terms of the same map of, of the southern part of the island of Manhattan. 
another uh, interesting thing that they did is they saw, well, so how are we going to clean this dust up? So we don't want to sweep it up. It's probably better if we get it wet. Um, so they got it wet, and they found that when they got it wet, the dust that was outdoors that had been exposed for a little while, that the pH, if you're familiar with the pH scale, 7 is neutral, and going this way is what we call a basin. The further you get from 7, the more caustic it is. And this is saying this is caustic and this is not so bad. The outdoor dust plotted here, but the indoor dust plotted here, which um, was pretty caustic. So they cautioned people, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get the indoor dust wet, or if you do, you should, you know, use instruments to do that, or protection to do that. Um, this was actually another study I thought I'd throw in there. It wasn't one from the US, USGS, but it was a similar one. They were looking at the stuff that was suspended in the air, the aerosols, and this is looking at the different um, organic compounds that were part of the aerosols. This would fit well with what the physicists were trying to do in terms of deciding was it, you know, did it get brought down by um, something other than the planes. Okay, so. Um, the USGS scientists turned this information over at that point to the public, of course. Um, and where did it go from there? And I'll, I'll just end with this. The public health officials then took it from there. So the biologists, the, the medical profession said, hey, what about the firefighters? What about the people that were the first to respond? Because they're the ones that were breathing all of this in. Um, and some studies that they did, this is public health, Things. Some studies that they did looked at um, a reactive airway, and when you get things in your lungs, this can cause a reactive airway disease. And this is this is the general public, and this is showing after one month, after three months, and after six months, the preponderance of reactive airway in the firefighters that um, that were first responders. So it, you know, it's something like for us, 9/11 is over, but for a lot of these firefighters and the first responders and the people that were on the scene. Um, these are health effects that are going to show much later in life. And I'm out of time for my video, so I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about what they found, and I'll leave you with this statement. Um, so reports of persistent health effects are sobering reminder that the disaster has far-reaching effects. And one cannot help but wonder what will be reported when we mark the 20th anniversary of this tragedy. So we're doing ongoing studies of the effects of this dust on the people that were exposed to it. And um, the little video clip actually um, talks about a study that was done at a hospital in New York City and is showing a higher percentage of, of, of first responders who are now coming down with um, lung cancer. So it's sort of um, as a result of what the dust was composed of. And my contribution to the class was, as I mentioned, about literature. And these are some of the books that have been written about 9-11. There's a collection of poetry, a couple of novels, a collection of stories um, there at the, at the far end. And the one that we focused on in the class was Falling Man by Don DeLulo. And the opening pages of this book depict a, a man coming out of the towers with the destruction all around him. And I can't tell you how much more vivid that opening scene was after we'd studied about what was in the dust and after we'd talked about the buildings coming down and all the context that these different disciplines brought to the literature made the students' reading experience much more powerful. Um, we've talked a lot about the questions that each discipline asks and my discipline in English and humanities, uh, we often ask questions about images and text and uh, we often think about how do we make sense of our, our lived experiences by writing them down or by creating art out of them. We also ask, what are the human ties that, tie, that characterize our, our experience? The things that all of us have similar. And the key thing that I, focus, I want to focus on just for a minute here is a, an important image from 9-11. A lot of the oral histories of people who were there the morning of 9-11 talk about horrific detail. Uh, people who were either forced or chose to jump out of the buildings um, to their death, but to escape the fire. And there are images of this going around. There's one famous one called The Falling Man. And there's a, an article even that did, there was an investigator reporter who tried to find out who this man was. Uh, and I'm going to show that image. You see him dressed in white shirt, slacks, 
uh, falling from the towers. Um, this image is so powerful that a literary artists used it in multiple ways. And so the book that we read, Falling Man, deals with this. There's a performance artist in this book who goes around and tries to mimic this image. And every time he does that, the people who see it are instantly shocked and taken back to that morning on September 11th and they relive the horror and the trauma. And the book is about trying to get through that trauma. Another book that you may be more familiar with, it's called Extremely Loud, Incredibly Close. It was made into a movie a couple years ago with Tom Hanks and Sandra Bullock. But at the very end of this book, and you're not gonna be able to see this, but it has a flip picture at the very end. And if you flip the pages, it shows the falling man. But instead of coming down, as you flip the pages, he comes back up. And it's a symbol that the book uses, it's the conclusion to the book, trying to talk about the ways in which the characters in this book found fullness, found healing, found a restoration for other, to, from their lives before. So both of them found that falling man image really important. And as a humanist, as, a, as an English professor, how that image can be used as a symbol is really fascinating to, to explore. And I want to conclude by reading one more a short literary text that uses the same image. This is a, from a, a Nobel Prize winning poet, she's Polish, her name is Wisała Sinborska, and she wrote a poem called Photograph of September 11th. And I like teaching poetry because we can just read it together here, and then I'll have some concluding thoughts. So she writes, they jumped from the burning floors, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. The photograph halted them in life, and now keeps them above the earth, toward the earth. Think about that photo I showed earlier with the still life. Each is still complete, with a particular face and blood well hidden. There's enough time for hair to come loose, for keys and coins to fall from pockets. They're still within the air's reach, they're still within the air's reach, within the compass of places that have now just opened. I can only do two things for them. Describe this flight and not add a last line. I'm really touched by this poem and the idea that if you're describing this moment when the man is falling, the logical end of that when you're in the poem is that the fall will continue. And so her act of charity, her act of empathy for those who suffered on 9-11 is to never end her poem. This is a poem that won't end because she won't add her last line symbolically. And for me that's the message that I'm, I'm thinking about today on September 11th is the idea of remembering as, of those who have been affected by it the victims on that day, the first responders that Renee talked about, um, those who served in the military and contributed to the, the burden of 14 years, uh, or 13 years of war since 9-11. And I think also those in countries all around the world who've been caught in the crossfire of the war of terror. Uh, this is something that's affected the world. And I think it's something that we need to remember, the most, both the nobility and the the power, the unity, and the courage that we see from 9-11. And also we need to remember some of the negative things that come to it and try to minimize those. Thank you for your time. Um, I think we've got one minute, two minutes for a question. Or we can end early. Right here in the middle. I'm sorry? Yes. Go back there. I think that's a great way to end it too, actually. We'll all come to different conclusions, and, and Professor Smith talked about that. But hopefully general education will teach us all the questions we can ask that can lead us to our two conclusions. And so that's a good idea to end with. Sometimes it's more important to have powerful questions. It's as important to have powerful questions as it is to have the right answers. Thank you.